First Presbyterian Church on this uh, Sunday morning. A uh, couple announcements, everything's in the bulletin, but just uh, to reiterate a couple of the more important announcements. Uh, one is that we are having our annual congregational meeting today after worship. Um, so you are invited to stay for the postlude. If you need to get up and move around a little bit, you're free to do that, but don't go anywhere too far away. We'll go ahead and, and head into the meeting. If you are a member of this church, you are strongly requested to remain for the meeting. If you are not a member of this church, you are invited to remain. Um, if you'd like to see what happens at an annual congregational meeting, but if you want to get home to lunch, uh, that we understand that as well. Um, additionally, I was asked to point out that we are really trying to get our uh, photo directory done. And uh, the funny thing about a photo directory is that you need photos <laughs> of the people in the directory. So, uh, several uh, have not gotten their photos done yet, and Warren is prepared. He has his... Uh, camera here, so uh, please make sure to touch base with Morna to get your picture taken if you have not already submitted uh, a picture or gotten your, uh, your picture taken. Um, and we are uh, set it, setting a deadline for this, April 1st, so you have uh, a month to get it done. Um, it's been a couple years, so, <laughs> so we don't feel like we're cutting it off too short. Uh, friends, that's all for the announcements. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Please rise in body or in spirit to join in the call to worship. All of us with unveiled faces are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. This is the Lord, the Spirit. Let us worship God.
Therefore, I declare that your sins are forgiven. Turn to God with faith that is unveiled. Believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
They heard a voice say, this is my son, listen to him. And then after that, they went off the mountain and they started you know, doing healings. So it's pretty kind of important things. We have praying, we have listening to God, and we have doing things. Now, we have kind of a similar story we're also going to hear when Moses used to go talk to God. And when he would talk to God, it would cause his face to just glow. Well, super bright. So people, so the other people when he come down the mountain were like, oh my gosh, his face is just too bright. So he had to wear a veil whenever he was around people. And it kind of made me think, you know what, Claire? Hey? Yeah. Yeah, just kidding. Did you know that you saw me at the Y the other day? Did you not recognize me? Because you're used to seeing me with a mask. And you're used to seeing me in this outfit. And I saw you with a lie and I said, hi. And you looked at me and you thought, I think I know that lady, but I don't know how or why. And that's kind of what happened with Moses. They were like, we think we know Moses, but he looks so weird. And the story, what I really, really like, what I really want to remember about this story is that sometimes God changes us. Sometimes people might recognize us or not when we're changed by God. But always we're called to pray to God, we're called to listen to God, and we're called to help other people because that's what God wants us to do. So, on that note, next time you see me without a mask, maybe you'll know who I am. I don't know. Maybe you, maybe you will, maybe you won't. She's, she's just a baby. Let's stand up and pray. Holy God, we thank you for your spirit that changes people. We thank you for the gift of prayer and for the gift of listening and for the gift of acting. We pray that we would act to help others for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, you are God's beloved child. With you, God is well
found on page 69 of your Hugh handout. Now, eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent in those days, in those days, and no one told any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just, when, um, just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. And suddenly, a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. And Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. By your spirit, O oh God, enlighten our hearts, open our minds, and fill our vision with your radiance, and give us life as we hear your word today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. I've been struggling with what to say today. I know that, like me, many of you have been consumed with and heart-sickened by the developments in Ukraine over the last few weeks, and especially over the last few days. But what is there to say? So I'll begin with a prayer from Reverend Dr. Diane Moffat. She's the President and Executive Director of the Presbyterian Mission Agency. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. As tensions heighten and the threat of war escalates in our despair, we turn to you. And in our waiting, we pray for your spirit to move as we put our faith and trust in you. In the face of uncertainty, you are our rock. In the worry of war, you are our hope. Bring peace, we pray, in your holy name. Amen. Of course, this prayer is already outdated, as we are no longer in a place of threat of war. Many in this church family have close connections with friends in Ukraine. Many have hosted Ukrainians in your homes. You have visited Ukraine personally. Some of these relationships are ongoing, and some have become family. And because of these relationships, we are particularly pained by the war that has begun. But we don't need to personally know a single Ukrainian to be troubled at this time. I don't know who Mona Lisa Amida is, 
but I was touched by something she wrote, which a friend of mine shared on Facebook. She wrote, Ukraine matters not because of its resources or what it contributes to the global economy. Ukraine matters because there are people there, living their everyday lives. Kids who go to school, people who are in pursuit of their dreams. There are families, there are animals, plants, people, and then pets. Somebody's grandparents, sister, brother, couples who love each other, parents, caring for their children. There are communities, neighbors, and friends. Ukraine matters because there are living beings who want to and deserve to continue living and dreaming and hoping and loving. As some of you know, I studied Russian in high school and in college, and I spent a semester in Russia in the city of Krasnodar, which is not far from the Black Sea, not far from Ukraine. It is a country and culture I love. And I know that many Russians, so many Russians, are grieving this war too. And many have had the courage to publicly protest this war at great risk to their own personal safety, putting their very lives at risk. And so as we pray for the Ukrainians, let us pray too for the Russians, remembering that whatever we may feel or say about the leader who is assuredly the one and only person in the position to be taking these actions, let us pray for the Russians too. Let us pray for Europe. Let us pray for the world. I offer this prayer by the poet to Anne Weems. I no longer pray for peace. On the edge of war, one foot already in, I no longer pray for peace. I pray for miracles. I pray that stone hearts will turn to tender heartedness and evil intentions will turn to merciful, and all the soldiers already deployed will be snatched out of harm's way, and the whole world will be astounded onto its knees. I pray that all the God talk will take bones and stand up and shed its cloak of faithful faithlessness and walk again in its powerful truth. I pray that the whole world might sit down together and share its bread and its wine. Some say there is no hope. But then I've always applauded the holy fools who never seem to give up on the scandalousness of our faith. That we are loved by God. That we can truly love one another. I no longer pray for peace. I pray for miracles. In today's gospel account, we see miracles. We see the transfiguration. And I'm struck by the image of Jesus' glowing face. And I wonder if perhaps some of that glow reflected off the faces of Peter, John, and James as they saw him. We all know that yawns are contagious. Similarly, when we see someone else with a smile of joy, happiness, or laughter, often we involuntarily smile too. And I'm wondering if Peter, James, and John's faces, too, had a certain, albeit dimmer, glow to it. Like the glow Moses had after speaking to God. I wonder if the disciples, all of them, not only the three present at the Transfiguration, but all of the disciples might have been called to be the face of Jesus. Those disciples trying and failing to heal the boy, were they not called to be the face of Jesus? Are we not called to be the face of Jesus? When I think of being the face of Jesus, I can't help but think of Teresa of Avila, the medieval mystic who wrote, Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which Christ walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which Christ blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet. 
Yours are the eyes, and yours are Christ's body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. And I would add, Christ has no face on earth but yours. Granted, those are some pretty big sandals to fill, being Christ's body, hands, feet, eyes, and face in the world. And thinking of ourselves as the face of Jesus might be more intimidating than comforting. How do we even begin to do it? How might we be the face of Jesus to the world? And today's scripture shows us the way. First, through prayer. Jesus went up to the mountain to pray. And in fact, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is praying when many of the key events take place. And here, while he is praying, his face is transfigured. <clears throat> Next, we listen to him. That voice speaking out of the cloud reminds us of the voice of Jesus' own baptism. In the Gospel of Luke, at the time of Jesus' baptism, the voice from heaven said, You are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And we don't know if anyone other than Jesus heard the voice, but the implication is that, in Luke's version at least, only Jesus heard that voice at his baptism. But here, at the time of the transfiguration, the three disciples present definitely hear that voice proclaiming, This is my Son, my Chosen. Listen to Him. Listen to Christ. Pray and listen. And finally, then we act. Jesus comes off the mountain and immediately He heals a child. Immediately, he's working to alleviate the suffering in the world. How might we as individuals, how might we as a church act to alleviate suffering in the world? Holy One, may we each, as individuals and as a church, may we be Christ's body, hands, feet, eyes, and face to the world as we pray for miracles. Amen. Friends, today we are installing Taylor McDonald as deacon and Kevin Pasca as elder. Kevin and uh, Taylor were not able to be here when we did our first set of installations and renovations, come on up right now. Oh, where's Kevin? Oh, he's Hello, Kevin, come on up. And I invite you to stand right here. And at some point, I'll have to turn around and face this a little bit. So the purpose is to install Kevin as an elder, a member of the session and Taylor as deacon. Kevin, they have both been ordained before, so once you're ordained, you're always ordained. Uh, so today we simply install. Please join in the litany of installation you'll find in your bulletin. There are different gifts, but it is the same spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God. But it is the same God whose purpose is to achieve through all. Each one is given a gift by the Spirit to use it for the common good. Together, we are the body of Christ, and individually members of Him. Though we have different gifts, together we are a ministry of reconciliation led by the risen Christ. We work and pray to make the church useful in the world, and we call women and men to faith, so that in the end, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God. Within our common ministry, some members are chosen for particular work as deacons and ruling elders. In ordination, we recognize these special ministries, Remembering that our Lord Jesus said, Whoever among you wants to be great, 
must become the servant of all, and the first among you must be the slave of all. Just, Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. So now the questions to the candidates, and I remind you that um, the, an the right answer is always in the affirmative. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, Savior, acknowledge Him Lord of all and Head of the Church, and through Him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the Church universal, and God's word to you? If so, say, I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to do and believe? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If say, say, I will. Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and continually guided by our confessions that say, say, I will with God's help? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, say, I will with God's help. Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, say, I will. I will. will you, do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, say, I will. I will. will you seek to serve people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, say, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. Taylor, will you be a faithful deacon? teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need. In your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so you say, I will with God's help. And Kevin, will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving and governing bodies of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will with God's help. Okay, so. Go ahead and turn around, and now the congregation is going to answer some questions. Do we, the members of the church, accept Taylor as a deacon and Kevin as an elder, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation, to guide us in the way of Jesus Christ? We do. We do. Do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church? We do. do. And now um, I invite you, uh, we're not going to do a physical laying on our hands, this is COVID times, but either from your seat or standing up, please extend your hands out uh, as long as, we'll see who works out more. How, depending on how long you can keep your hands up. Let us pray. The Bible tells us, O oh God, that one of the first things the early church did after Jesus ascended into heaven was to elect new officers to serve the body of Christ. By that venerable tradition, we come today to install our own new church officers and ask your blessings on them and the congregation they serve. We think we know these officers and what they are like, but you know them even more intimately than we do, O oh God. We pray, therefore, that you will anoint them with your Holy Spirit to lead them into the most imaginative and productive work of which they are capable. Give them unbounded energy and enthusiasm for their tasks. Help them to be sensitive not only to the feelings of others, but to the needs of our congregation and the world we serve. In the words of the ancient prophet, let them do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. Let their responsibility bind them more closely to you, 
so that they inevitably become more spiritual in their days daily living. Grant that their relations with one another will be strong and healthy, and that they will challenge one another to do their very best. We ask you to bless their families, and they too will grow through their experiences. For many of these officers, dear God, their labor for the church will mean a sacrifice of personal time and energy. But we remember that we serve a Lord who sacrificed everything on our behalf. Therefore, we offer this prayer in his name, and for the sake of the kingdom he preached. Amen. Thank you very much. You are installed.
uh, joy and concern. Uh, we have a lot of prayers of concern this morning. As is the custom in this congregation, please do let me know your prayer requests uh, throughout the week or before worship so that I can share them during worship. And when I do, I will conclude with either God in your grace or God in your mercy and invite you to help me lift it to God by responding, hear our prayer. We begin with a prayer uh, for Joanne Munger's family. You may recall last week we uh, shared a prayer for uh, a cousin who had gone on hospice, and sadly, this week her cousin did that. So her cousin Mary, we pray for Joanne and for her family as they grieve. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for Ukraine. We pray for miracles in Ukraine. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And along those lines, Tom Weeks has requested prayers uh, specifically for their Ukrainian family. Uh, daughter Paula and sister Sveta and mother Maria uh, have all been, uh, been brought to the U.S. Uh, long ago, but left in Ukraine are their family and friends. And Tom notes it's been a really rough few days for all of them. God in your mercy. Our church in the Presbytery, who we pray for this week, is Scotch Ridge, Scotch Ridge Presbyterian Church, that's kind of a tongue twister, uh, which is in Carlisle, and their pastor, Reverend Kip Harris. God in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we pray for not only peace in Ukraine, but also throughout the world in all war-torn areas. God in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for our divided country and for our broken world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers, continuing in prayer. To you, O Lord, we pray, answer us with mercy. Almighty, all-merciful God, lover of justice and giver of peace, hear our prayer. For your people, Israel, for the Church of Jesus Christ, and for all who seek your face. To you, O oh Lord, we pray, answer us with mercy. For leaders and elders, that they will abide by your commandments. To you, O oh Lord, we pray, answer us with mercy. For the earth that you have made, trembling for redemption and recreation. To you, O oh Lord, we pray. Answer us with mercy. For those who are tormented by the demons of illness, addiction, and grief. To you, O oh Lord, we pray. Answer us with mercy. Let our lives and our world be transfigured by your glory and transformed by your love. In the name of Jesus Christ, your chosen one, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
make haste to be kind, and may the blessing of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit be with you now and always.